Jason Stark joins us here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you doing, Jason? Rich, I am great. How are you doing? It's been too long. Been way, way, long. way, way too long. Awesome to join you. Thank, Thank you. you. Right back at you. Uh, okay, place into perspective for me what Otani's done so far for the Angels. <laughs> He's one of the most talented human beings who has ever played baseball. I think it's that simple. Uh, he throws a baseball 100 miles an hour. Uh, over his first two starts, he had a stretch where 34 consecutive hitters came to the plate and didn't get a hit. He hit homers three games in a row when they let him swing a bat. He hit a home run off Cy Young, <laughs> Corey Kluber, and he's one of the, say, ten fastest players in baseball. I mean, we just don't see human beings who can do the things he's doing. So the question is, is how sustainable is it over a 26, you know, weeks, over, over a season that goes, you know, obviously as many months as it goes? Well, you, you remember there was, uh, there was quite the frenzy over the winter of teams trying to sign him, yep. and that's why. Um, those teams expected this. Um, I've talked to scouts who watched him play in Japan 40 or 50 times, and they expected this. Now, look, there's a lot of information in the game. It's, it's harder to succeed now than at any time because – if there's any flaw, any flaw that you have, the sport will figure it out and figure it out fast, and they will test you. And he will be tested. It can't possibly keep up like this. He'll be the greatest player who ever lived. But can he sustain it? He's 23 years old. Um, this, is, this is his skill set. This is his track record in Japan. I think most people who have seen a lot of him would be surprised if he didn't. Not if he did. Give me the odds of this happening, Jason Stark, that your starting pitcher for the American League All-Star team and your third place hitter for the American League All-Star team starter is the same guy in D.C. <laughs> Seriously, what I, do you think? I hope you're right. I like his chances of making the team at, at this rate. Um, I, I just worry that the Angels might want to step in and say he can do one or the other and not both. That would be awful. Let's, let, let's start the campaign right now, okay? Well, what's more likely to happen, 20 wins or 30 homers from him? Uh, I will go 30 homers just because nobody in baseball won 20 last year. And, and you know, the, the way that pitchers are treated this year, the number of times they're allowed to go through the lineup, mm -hmm. it, it's almost impossible to win 20 anymore. Jason Stark joining me here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. And the Red Sox uh, are on fire right now. They came back from five runs down. Uh, in the eighth inning to win uh, their eighth uh, of nine games to start. Um, are, are they the team, uh, along with Houston? Which one's better in this league, do you think? Well, um, I, I would take Houston. I, you know, I, was, I, I saw the Red Sox only lost on opening day in Tampa Bay. They shouldn't have lost that game. Gave up, bullpen gave up six runs in the eighth inning that day. It was kind of the mirror image of what happened yesterday. They're, they've taken advantage of a soft schedule. Um, Rays and Marlins, that's it. That's all they've played. But, they, I mean, they've got a real advantageous schedule for the most part over the first 40 games or so. So they're, they're good. They're, they're way better than they were given credit for. Um, they kind of got lost in the Yankee hype machine. But if you're going to ask me who, who's the best team on paper in the American League, yeah. I, I can't find a weakness in the Astros. Can you? No, I know. They're they're so good, and I love their manager. So um, but, again, the way that the Angels are playing, I mean, if Otani is – and, you know, uh, Pujols has shown up as well in the first 10 games. Uh, Trout hit one that's still traveling yesterday. <laughs> um, I, I'm telling you, uh, this is fascinating. I think Houston has some competition in the AL West um, obviously, the Yankees are playing 500 ball right now, and their their bullpen looks uh, uh, beatable, which is something that uh, did not happen last October. And I mean, Stanton, somebody, uh, Buck Showalter walked Judge to get to Stanton. That actually happened yesterday, <laughs> Jason. Uh, Rich, I mean, he's got 20 strikeouts, seven hits, two singles. I mean, that's his stat line. He, you know, he gets himself into these things. He gets himself out of these things. But right now, you can pitch to that guy. 
um, if you had your choice of which of those two behemoths to pitch to, you would pitch to Giancarlo. Hmm. I, I, I don't even know. Did that ever happen in Miami? I mean, once? <laughs> Where somebody was intentionally walked to get to him. Well, he, you know, he had a stretch two years ago where he went, if I remember this right, was, was 0 for 48 with 26 strikeouts. Mm -hmm. You couldn't be much more lost than that. Um, he, you know, he got himself into a zone last year uh, when he closed up his stance where it hit, he hit a home run every day. You know, he had, what, 18 home runs in one month. And, Baseball just doesn't work that way. He he can't find that sweet spot right now, and when he does, he ties himself up, he gets himself out, he swings and misses over and over, and that's what you're seeing now. But, I mean, he's one adjustment away from turning right back into Babe Ruth. And, you know, he he's the second guest on my baseball story show, yep. and, uh, you know, we taped this recently. And just, just to give you a little sneak preview, he yep. thinks he can hit 100 homers. I'll take the under, but <laughs> that's what he told me. Well, not swinging like that. I mean, no. he, you know, as a Yankee fan, he looked—he looked right now. He looks like Jesse Barfield with uh, with without many holes in his swing. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I, I, Jesse Barfield reference. I did. Yeah, I mean, Bar Jesse Barfield was the king of swinging at pitches that were spinning 19 feet out of the zone, and no. uh, you know, but he could also bop. You know, I mean. Look, obviously, we're, we're real early. And before we do get to talking about your show on, on Stadium Baseball Stories, uh, the Gabe Kapler gets booed. It, and it, it seems to me like, uh, again, you know, the Phillies, it's they're three and five. It's it's not a complete disaster out of the gate, like, say, Tampa or uh, or Cincinnati, San Diego, which lost in a way that a Pop Warner team loses uh, <laughs> in Houston on a pop fly in the 10th inning uh, in between the catcher and the, and the pitcher's mound. Um, but here, Jason, the reason why I bring all of this up is have we seen, are we at the spot where managers who are being hired for their analytics have no feel? They are not going gut. They're not going heart. They're just going straight by the book. Are we seeing that right now? Well, if you're referring mostly to Gabe Kapler. Um, or, or, or Aaron Boone, in a way, obviously. He's, he's made a couple of moves that have left some people scratching heads on occasion as well in New York. I mean, you're, you're talking about guys who had never managed a meaningful baseball game until last week. And, you know, I'm willing to allow both of them a, a learning curve, but it, it certainly shows up when millions of people are watching. And that's what we've seen. You know, I, as you know, um, I live in Philadelphia. I grew up in Philadelphia. Yeah. And uh, I'm never amazed by anything that happens in Philadelphia. I, I know I know that booing is what Philadelphians do. I, I've seen it. I, I get it. But this is kind of amazing because this is what people in Philadelphia wanted, right? They wanted a, a team that was new age, not old school. They wanted a front office that delved into the data. Uh, and they wanted a manager who didn't fit those traditional old managerial molds. And within a week, they decided that's not what they want at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I understand that this guy is off to a, uh, a, a rough start. It, I mean, he, he did some things in his first week as manager that I vehemently disagree with that are really the talk of the sport. But he's different. And I think because he's so different than anybody who's ever done that job, there are people who are inherently offended by that in baseball and don't want him to succeed. And I do think some of what you're seeing is a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Athletics and MLB Networks, Jason Stark, your baseball stories, 30-minute episodes on Stadium every single uh, Tuesday night on WatchStadium.com. First up is Mark McGuire, an old buddy of mine, uh, from back in the Sports Center days, how open is Mark about the past, Jason? Well, I was really grateful that he was willing to do this, Rich. Um, he's turned down a lot of requests to talk about what happened 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and he said yes to me. And so, I, you know, I let him reminisce for a while. Um, he has a lot of great memories of he that does. season. He's allowed to have them. He was the man in the middle of the circus. But obviously, at a certain point, we turned to a, a, a topic that had to come up, and that was PEDs. And when I said to him, let's play the what-if game. 
Could you have hit 70 home runs if you had not taken PEDs? Everything about him changed. Uh, his, his demeanor changed. His expression changed. The way he delivered the words changed. And he could not have been more adamant that, yeah, he could. Absolutely, is what he said. And obviously, I pushed back on that. And it was interesting to hear him defend it. Um, his feeling is he was a born home run hitter. He was, from though. The moment he came into he baseball. Was, he hit his, how many, he had, what, 49 home runs? Stick thin. Uh, he I, led the league in homers and slugging in his first year right. in the big leagues. Right. That was 11 years before he broke that record. And so he's right. He was. He has a case for that. He looked a lot different then. Um, he feels that with everything he learned about himself, everything he learned about hitting, sure he could have hit 70 home runs. I think we all have reason to be skeptical of that. I pointed, pointed out to him on the show that since there's been testing, not only has no one hit 70, no one has even hit 60. Right? Nobody's come close to this. But his defense of himself is really interesting. And I, you know, part of my role in this show is to let people express themselves. And so I did. Well, I'm biased, Jason. You know, uh, I, I he, he couldn't be one of the nicer guys that you will ever come across. The way, again, regardless, PEDs or not, when he was going through the breaking of Maris's streak, he had everybody following him. He had the commissioner following him from stadium to stadium, inning to inning, at bat to at bat. He had networks following him. He had the Maris family following him. He had his ex-wife and his son and his uh, ex-wife's new husband following him. And he was as gracious and perfect a human being as there could be as he was going through it. And I, I, I again, you know, uh, I, I've just been biased about him for years. Uh, the PED use is beyond disappointing and upsetting, but I do. I, I don't know why he did it, uh, other than the fact that maybe everyone was doing it and he was exposed to it in 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 Oakland. I don't know why, and I I guess that that's a question for the ages when it all yeah, comes well, down. Yeah, well, I was it. one of those people following him around that year. I saw right. him hit 17 homers, and I agree with you. Um, you know, the people who thought he was not being as accessible to folks like us as they wanted him to be, missed something important about him. He, it was very important to him to be a teammate. And he hated the fact that his team was not having a good year. Um, all these people were there just to talk to him. And there were 24 human beings around him in that room who he cared about. And he didn't want to be a sideshow. And that was the reason that there were days he just didn't want to do it. But when he did, I thought he was awesome. And, you know, here's what I would ask you, because I've thought about this myself. I, I, I bring it up in my conversation with him. Mm -hmm. When I covered that story, I thought it was the greatest story I ever covered, mm -hmm. the greatest thing I ever witnessed, because that the stuff that you saw, the people who showed up, uh, Barbara Walters came by one day, right? Uh, Bruce Springsteen was leaning against the batting cage one day. It was incredible. It was such Circus. a huge story every day. And now, knowing what we know, what happens to those memories? What do we do with them? I will never forget them. I think it is great? No, I, I, yes, it was great. It was great. It was great. It brought baseball back. I remember Cal Ripken obviously broke Lou Gehrig's streak and took that, took that lap around uh, Camden Yards, and everybody uh, started healing from the strike. And then uh, McGuire and Sosa hit. And I understand that they were doped up. Sosa still hasn't even come close to admitting it. Um, but uh, it was incredible. McGuire still had to hit the home runs. And now you could sit here and people might sit here and think, hey, look, he was he was cheating, et cetera, et cetera. He still did it. He still did it. You know, I, I think he only went one day with everybody following him around and he broke that record and it was and it was all over after that and then the home run derby with the all century team at the all-star game in Fenway Park I'm getting goosebumps wow. talking about it yep where he hit all those home runs in his at bat in the home run derby and he broke his bat in the middle of it I remember that I was doing with Stuart Scott and I were, were interviewing the players as they were coming off of the uh, at their at bats. He broke his bat in the middle of it and still hit all those home runs. It was remarkable. Ted Williams coming out and asking him about hitting at, at the pitcher's mound. 
It's as great as it is, and I will always cherish it, Jason, and I'm not embarrassed to say it. Really well, not. you're really going to love this show then. <laughs> well, <it's laughs> because a- I, I did let him reminisce, and his memories are happy memories. He, you know, however conflicted people like us might be trying to figure out what to make of it now, mm-hmm. he doesn't share that. He, you know, he remembers it as a as a great summer. Well, that's as an awesome experience. That's tomorrow night, seven to seven thirty p.m. every Tuesday night uh, on WatchStadium.com. Jason, don't be a stranger. Let's do this on the regular, okay? I miss chatting Rich, with you. Rich, that'd be awesome. It was a total pleasure. Likewise, Thanks. right back at you at Jason St on Twitter. The Rich Eisen Show weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.